Okay, everybody, I'm back. Uh, still trying to taste, uh, shake the taste of that banana out of my mouth, but uh, overall, I guess that uh, eating it once instead of eating it four times is probably a little bit better for me in the long run. Uh, by the way, it's awful. Don't, don't do it. I'm sure there's some kind of chemical on that thing that's going to cause my skin to peel off personally. Now, this uh, first part that we're going to look at after the intro is called Business and Entrepreneurs. I'm going to warn you in advance, this one's going to be the longest one of the videos that you guys watch. There's a lot of information in this one. The ones where the tail end will be way shorter. Um, but in this, in this, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some business leaders in some of the major businesses of that time, and we're also going to talk about some big changes in business. Okay. So again, there's kind of your preview. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt and the railroad uh, industry and what he did for that industry. We're going to talk a little bit about Andrew Carnegie and steel, John Rockefeller and the oil business. Then we're going to take a look at some kind of big idea things that, that changed during this time period. The uh, Biggest innovation being the assembly line that's the more modern version that we're used to. Uh, we're going to talk about the corporation and how that changes the game business-wise. Uh, a little bit about trusts and monopolies and, um, and, and kind of how those change things from the idea of people owning their own businesses or partnerships, which still exist today, but a little bit different. And, but the big thing I need you guys to get out of this is this French word off this slide, entrepreneur. Um, there's, I'm sure there's some great Google definition that you can use. But an entrepreneur is generally someone who takes risks in business. That can be someone who does it directly uh, as a boss, as a manager, as an owner of a corporation or a big business. Uh, that could also be someone who invests money in a big business, so a financier. We're going to start off by looking at Cornelius Vanderbilt and the railroads. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but this dude has some, I'm jealous of his sideburns. They come out almost to his shoulders in some pictures that I've seen. Um, but Vanderbilt makes his money, his, his hundreds of millions, in the railroad business. And the reason he chooses that is because railroads were a business that were on the rise. Um, the Transcontinental Railroad being finished in the late 1860s really gave birth to this idea that the train was going to be a difference maker in the United States. It was going to allow us uh, to save time, obviously going from six months to six weeks to get across, the, or six days to get across the continent. It was also going to save money. Uh, this doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but shipping something across the country on the train would cut your costs ridiculously as opposed to having someone haul it on a wagon. There were some problems with the train though at this point in history when we, we start this chapter. Uh, there were only 30,000 miles of track. Now, 30,000 sounds probably not that bad to you. If I handed you $30,000, you'd probably be pretty happy. I'd be your favorite. Um, I'd be poor. Uh, I wouldn't even have that much. But as, as far as getting around the country goes, imagine there only being 30,000 miles of road in the entire country. You wouldn't be able to get everywhere you wanted to go. Uh, there were a few lines that connected cities. You might have one option uh, to get from New York City to Chicago. Only one option, which is going to mean that if there's any problems, the cost can be high, the food can be terrible, the trains can be dirty. You're stuck with it if that's what you want to do. The average railroad was really only about 100 miles long. So if you think about traveling across the country, some trips across the country, you could change trains as many as 15 times just to get yourself across the country. For any of you guys who have ever flown and have had to change flights, I think you know that that would be a little bit of a pain in the butt. Also, the tracks varied in gauge. One company's tracks could be two feet apart, the next could be three, one could be 18 inches. And so the idea of like hooking the train system together wasn't as easy as it probably was cut out to be. But obviously the government steps in and they decide to subsidize or pay for some of these changes and they start regulating the business. Now we just need someone who's going to step in and be the leader, someone who's going to come up and make a ton of money, and that guy is, is going to be sweet sideburns, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, um, the winner in this business, obviously, Vanderbilt, and the way that he does it is kind of unique, and there's a lesson to take away from him. First of all, Cornelius Vanderbilt couldn't read or write at all uh, at this time we started this business. He could actually uh, read and write two words. Uh, they were Cornelius and Vanderbilt. And um, someone made the mistake of uh, kind of making fun of him once because he was I guess illiterate, and he laughed back at them when they said, what are you laughing at? He goes, well, all I need to be able to do to sign the contract to take over your business is to be able to sign my name, and then he promptly bought up the business for, uh, for a low cost. Um, he was a really tough businessman, uh, one of those guys who, uh, he might sell his children for the right price, I know you can have Cade for a low cost if you're interested, um, but he became a millionaire in the shipping business, in using boats, uh, mostly on the Great Lakes. Because before the train came along, the boats were the way to do things. They moved things the fastest. But he decided to sell everything that he had and invest in railroads. Kind of this idea that um, I don't see any of you guys walking around with tape players anymore, or CD players, or Walkmans. Now you guys all have everything on your phones. Heck, I don't even see iPods anymore. 
The idea being, if you don't keep moving forward, you're going to be left behind. And he saw that. So he had enough to buy one railroad line. And it just so happened that railroad line was the New York Central Railroad. It was the trunk line, and trunk line's a major, major train area, that went from New York City to Buffalo. It was really the only line into or out of New York City at that time. So he kind of had a monopoly on that. Over the course of the 10 years that he owned the New York Central Railroad, he made millions, hundreds of millions, and used that money to buy up more track. By the time he died, he controlled 45,000 miles of track himself compared to the 30,000 that existed in the entire country 17 years before. Um, he becomes the first major railroad baron who leaves his kids tons of money. I'll give you one quick story about his kids. Um, first of all, if you know who Anderson Cooper is, uh, the CNN news personality, his, his mom is a Vanderbilt, so Anderson Cooper is a Vanderbilt. But the kids took over the railroad business and enjoyed spending the money. One of the kids had a Halloween party where they decided that to make things look cool, they drained their indoor Olympic swimming pool and filled it full of imported pink champagne and bought 12 trumpeter swans and let the trumpeter swans sing, or swim, sing, bleh, let them swim in the champagne. And then when the party was over, um, they took the swans to Central Park and just let them go. And then they drained an Olympic sized swimming pool full of French imported champagne into the New York City sewer system. So that's, that's how you know you have too much money. Um, now, kind of the big lesson to take away from Cornelius Vanderbilt is, is kind of don't let the world pass you by. You know, if you are really good at something, but you see that something else might be coming along to replace that, you need to make sure that you step up and step in and stay with the times. All right? Now, our next guy is going to be Andrew Carnegie. I think he looks a lot like Santa. Uh, so I don't know how well you can see that picture, but you might want to Google him. You know, Santa, Andrew Carnegie might be the same guy. And Andrew Carnegie was involved in the steel business. Now, steel was in pretty major demand. Uh, steel was going to become this building material that we needed in order to become a modern nation. You need it for railroad tracks. You need it to build skyscrapers. You need it for suspension bridges, better parts for machines that won't break down as quickly. The problem is it was expensive to produce. Back then, you needed a large supply of iron, which we didn't necessarily know we had. And you needed a system for heating it up, removing the impurities, cooling it, and turning it into that steel. But you had to get rid of all that junk. And it took a long time. It was done by hand. It wasn't a very good process. And so steel was extremely expensive and was only available for the rich. A man in England named Bessemer invented this machine that looks, it looks a lot like the back end of a cement truck. And what it does is it, it mixes it, heats it up, and then they blow air through it. It burns off all the impurities in one shot. And essentially, it can make steel in about 100 times less time than before, which is going to increase the supply. The demand is still going to be high, but it's going to bring down the cost, making it more available to more people. We also find, found that about this time that we had an iron supply in a place called the Masabi Range in Minnesota. That Masabi Range borders on Lake Superior, so it was going to make hauling that iron easy to a city somewhere along the Great Lakes. Carnegie took advantage of all this. He was a Scottish immigrant. He came to the United States with hardly anything when he was 12 years old. He worked a lot of jobs and he saved a lot of money and got involved in the iron industry. He, he sold iron to these people that wanted to make steel. But then eventually what he did is he sold all of his business and invested it all in steel. He traveled overseas to Bessemer's factory and he looked at the machines and he made kind of mental notes and things. Came back to the United States and had engineers build him these machines in Pittsburgh, which obviously is the steel capital of our country. Now, once he gets his, building, his business going, Carnegie Steel, he becomes the number one supplier of steel in the United States. He supplies the steel for the Brooklyn Bridge, the Washington Monument, Yankee Stadium, uh, most of the railroads and skyscrapers in our country that were built after 1872 get their steel from his company. Um, but then, he's out playing shuffleboard on his boat, because he can afford a boat, he's not a Scottish immigrant anymore. Um, he's out on his boat playing shuffleboard with J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan was a major banker at that time. And he sold his business to J.P. Morgan for $500, $500 million, kind of as a joke. Um, J.P. Morgan then took it over, changed the name of the company to U.S. Steel. And just to give you guys some, some concept of what's going on, they still produce about 60% of the world's steel today. The lesson that you can take away from this guy is, is don't be afraid to take a chance. He could have easily stayed in the iron industry, could have easily had a few million dollars, lived comfortably, and things like that. But at the time of his retirement, he was worth about $850 million. That's not that much compared to the next guy, though. 
Now, John Rockefeller in the oil business. First of all, John Rockefeller, not the nicest guy in the world. Um, deeply religious, but just kind of a jerk. Um, obviously leaves some money to charity upon his death. Uh, you could ice skate at Rockefeller Plaza and things like that. Um, but as far as his business practices go, he was a tough guy to deal with. Um, the history of oil is really weird. Um, farmers used to think they were cursed if they struck oil in their fields because they wouldn't be able to plant corn or wheat, and they didn't know what to do with it because it would just keep coming up out of the ground. They would curse their luck. People would come along with bottles and sell it door to door, and people took it as medicine and things like that. They just knew it was, it was kind of a pain in the butt when it popped up on your land. The first oil well, though, as we know, it was drilled by a guy named Edwin Drake in 1859 in a place called Titusville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Drake was plowing his field when he struck oil, and then they decided to try to harness that oil somehow because they realized it was flammable and they could sell it. Along this time, a guy named Samuel Keir comes along, and Keir figures out that if you refine oil or take away the impurities, you can produce different products, petroleum, jelly, gasoline, motor oil, waxes, lubricants, different kinds of things that, that people had a need for in this country. And then along comes Rockefeller. Now, Rockefeller's family owned a wholesale food business. What that means is they sold the food to the grocery stores. But he decided that was boring. He didn't want to do that for the rest of his life. So he sold his part of the family business and bought into the refineries, the actual factories that took crude oil, what comes out of the ground, and makes it into something useful like, like motor oil or gas. What he does, though, is as his refineries do well, he buys them more and more refineries. And then eventually when those refineries, he owns almost all of them, he starts to branch out into the other areas of the oil business as well. Rockefeller used cutthroat competition. Um, Rockefeller absolutely would run you into the ground. He would come into your area, he would lower his prices below what you could afford to sell your products for. And then when you couldn't afford to keep your business running anymore because you weren't making any profit, he would come in and make a low offer on your business and buy it out from under you. He thought competition was wasteful. He didn't see the point in trying to fight back and forth with someone when he could just crush them. Okay? In 1870, he starts what he calls the Standard Oil Company, which at that time was, was the company in the world. By 1878, he controls 90% of the oil business. Developed kind of a borderline monopoly on oil, but uh, he and his business partner, C.T. Dodd, figured out a way around that where the government had a really difficult time coming after them. He becomes America's first billionaire, and in, at that time, being a billionaire, uh, he was the only one. It's not like today where we can, we can rattle off some billionaires and sit here and joke, and some of you guys would know who they were and some of you weren't. He's it. He's the only one. Kind of the lesson that we take away from him is, I guess, be nice until it's time to not be nice, because he had a way with people where they would trust him, they would work with him, but then when he felt like it was time to crush you, that's what he would do. So new business practices. Uh, first one that you guys are used to is mass production, the assembly line. Uh, the idea that I'm going to do one piece of the job and then we're going to send it down to you. One of the major things that happens during this time period that allows the assembly line to be more effective is the conveyor belt. It brings the work to the worker. Uh, they used to have to, for instance, in car factories, the first car factories, they would tie a rope around the bumper and someone would have to drag the car uh, from one workstation to the next workstation. Uh, the assembly line is actually credited to Henry Ford, the, the head of Ford Motor Corporation. But some of the other ideas, the idea of interchangeable parts, uh, was developed by a guy named Eli Whitney. Now, Eli Whitney, you guys might know him because he invented the cotton gin, took the seeds out of the cotton. Um, interchangeable parts are basically this idea that, um, let's say, well, this. This used to start a car. Okay, this starts my car. But, the thing is, this is kind of expensive to make because there's a lot of metal here and things like that, and they break really easy and they have to be replaced. But this can also start my car. It's different, but it has the same purpose. It's made of a much cheaper material. Um, you know, they can obviously charge a little bit different for it and things like that. Uh, another example would be, um, you know, this is my house key. Pretty simple, pretty small. Made it kind of a cheap metal. They used to make house keys out of steel and iron, and they used to be shaped like this. But the idea of interchangeable parts is that you use something similar that's going to be cheaper and a little more cost effective. I always joke around about this, but in a way, you guys are interchangeable parts, and so am I. You guys come in every day, I love you to death, but next year there's going to be new freshmen, and who knows when, there'll be another teacher. And so we can all kind of be replaced the same way the part can be replaced. And then the idea of division of labor. You get really good at doing one specific part of the job. Uh, if you worked in a car factory, your job might be to tighten the lug nuts on the rear passenger tire. 
That's all you did all day long. They call it specialization or division of labor. Another innovation is the idea of the corporation. Before this, businesses came in one of two varieties. You had a sole proprietor, someone who owned their own business and worked for themselves, or you had a partnership, and I think you're all aware of what that is. But the problem is, you need a lot of money to start one of these businesses, to build a railroad, to build a steel factory, to build any kind of factory. And so someone came up with the idea of a corporation. Corporations sell stock to stockholders and invest that money in their business in order to be able to get things going quickly and effectively. As an investor, you're given stock, which shows you a part ownership of the company, but you don't have a ton of decision-making power. There's a board of directors that does that and people who take advantage of those situations. One of the primary reasons why people get involved in corporations is something called limited liability. Limited liability means you can only lose what you invest. So if I invest $100 in the Pepsi Corporation and they come up with some new drink that poisons millions of people and they get sued for a billion dollars, I only lose what I invest and I can't lose more than that. Another idea is the idea of a trust. Um, so it's kind of a twist on a monopoly. It's a way to do it without being caught for it. And what you do is, like for instance, if I own all of the jelly bean making companies in the country, I don't know, that's kind of stupid, but I like jelly beans. I could theoretically jack up the price, put down the quality and all those different things. The government doesn't like that, so they're going to sue me and make me give up part of my business. So what I can do is I can take people like my best friend Jason and I can put him in charge of all the jelly bean factories. And on paper, it looks like he's running things and he's making a profit for doing that. I can take another friend from college, Brian, and I can put him in charge of distribution and all the delivery trucks and things like that. And even though I'm one of the major sole benefactors, other people are running other parts of the business. And therefore, it stays a little bit more legal. Now, that's the end of part one. Uh, I know that one was a little bit long, but again, remember, you can stop it, you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can go back and do it again. And obviously, I'm around to answer questions. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next one.